Money. My name is Nozi Pombandro. Today we find ourselves in Johannesburg where we are gathered with 80 young innovators, young entrepreneurs from all over the continent brought together by the U.S. Embassy and they're here today to compete for a first prize worth 2,000 U.S. dollars which they will invest into their businesses. We're going to be finding out what they are doing to change the developmental landscape in their communities and of course in the broader continent. Now remember that if you want the Young Money crew to come to you, all you need to do is just drop us a tweet. Follow me at The Real Nosy or at CNBC Africa. And don't forget the hashtag, it's Young Money 410. We're starting off our conversation by speaking to the Assistant Cultural Attaché from the U.S. Embassy. His name is Nicholas Von Mertens. Uh, supporting entrepreneurship and innovation is a way of connecting the U.S. Embassy to many of the, uh, the participants from the countries they're, they're coming from. Um, it helps support job growth. And in many ways, it's giving them the freedom to pursue their, their interests. And what are you hoping is going to be the long-term impact of this particular initiative over and beyond today's competition and the prize money? What happens next? Look, I think uh, you know, we, we certainly hope and support all of the uh, companies and innovations that these participants bring to the table. But we also hope that we're really creating the, the entrepreneurship infrastructure that needs to exist in all of these countries um, to have successful small and medium-sized businesses. And what's been the experience thus far? We often hear that Africans are very entrepreneurial, but certainly if you take a look at the caliber of candidates that have come through here, how would you describe the quality of entrepreneurship amongst African young people? Oh, the quality is fantastic. Um, you know, I think all the partip participants have um, local knowledge and they bring local experience to the table, so they're finding and adapting solutions that are, 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 are meeting their facing in the problems they're facing in their communities. Nicholas, thank you so much. So we've heard from Nicholas what the big picture is, what the context is. Now, I'm told that these participants are going to be uh, dueling it out today in a dragon style den kind of context. So I'm going to put them on the spot and I'm going to ask each of the four countries that are here this morning to speak to us in 30 seconds and tell us exactly what their business does and let's take a look and see if they're worth 2,000 US dollars. Now four of the countries that are represented here have caught up with me this morning. We're going to be speaking for, to a representative from Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa and Nigeria and of course there's many many more. We're going to be putting these guys through a dry run of their pitching context. I'm giving them 60 seconds each so here's my clock and I'm going to ask them to tell us exactly what their business is doing, what their project is all about, and how they're actually changing the game in Africa. And we start off with Kenya. So you've got 60 seconds and your pitch starts now. My name is Florence Kamaiva, I'm from Kenya, and my company is Pad Heaven Initiative. At Pad Heaven, we are developing sanitary pads which are low cost and they're eco friendly. Uh, what we have in Kenya is a situation where young girls don't attend classes during their periods. We have at least 900,000 of them who stay in, 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 at home when they don't have uh, sanitary pads. So our product is eco-friendly. It is uh, made from banana stems, so it is locally available. It is also very, very affordable. So it is um, accessible to most of these low un um, income earners. So give me a sense of what's been the product uh, reception thus far. Have you done, uh, have you run a pilot? How has it been received in the market? Uh, we just have the prototype, we are testing it right now and we're hoping to start production in the next three months. What we are looking for is our funders and investors to come on board and help us scale this from prototype uh, to um, enable us to start manufacturing. So your time is officially up, fantastic. I have a couple of questions. You've been carrying uh, the sanitary pads in your hands. Um, just, so, just hold this up to the camera so we can see how uh, this aesthetically looks. Um, what, wh how does the inputting material change the actual product? How does using uh, bananas actually change the product? Um, we use banana stems that are already uh, waste. When farmers harvest, what they do is they cut down their banana stems. So these materials are already um, locally available, so it makes it very, very cheap. You also spoke about, of course, being at low cost, and you've reinforced that uh, point. Can you give us a distinction in terms of how much cheaper than the average sanitary pad this would be? This pad will be at least 60% cheaper than what is in the market. 
That is fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, we move on now to Tanzania, uh, where we're also going to be find out, finding out what the big idea is. Uh, welcome, sir. What's your big idea and how are you changing the landscape? Uh, my name is Ahad Katera and I'm the co-founder of Guave. This is a startup that wants to make Africa beautiful. Uh, so one of the problems we have in Dar es Salaam City is waste management. More than 60% of the waste is not collected. And according to one of the reports by Forbes, they say that Dar es Salaam was mentioned as one of the dirtiest cities in the world. Uh, we want to use this device to improve uh, uh, waste collection. In so this is, this is a mobile phone and Apple one in, in particular. So we're looking at the technology space. How are you leveraging this technology? Uh, so one is that uh, uh, so you have lots of uh, people with mobile pen, uh, with mobile phones uh, in Africa. So what we want to do is use SMS notifications uh, and, and reward systems to encourage households uh, to discard their waste. So they can get prizes or they can get awards every time they use our platform once they're registered. Can you give us an example of what an incentive would be uh, as a household? What would be a typical reward that I could get? So in most of the urban poor, you know, what makes so much sense is food. Uh, people like to communicate. So you can give them airtime. Once we have one sack of maize, and people who are doing well in terms of waste collection, we can always award them. And this trash that is collected can easily be sold out now to uh, different companies that use recyclables in manufacturing. And it certainly sounds like you're going to need uh, to be in partnership with a number of companies who would come in with the reward side of this of this business model. How has that experience been? Have you gotten the reception that you'd like? Yeah, so it's, so it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, so now the government in our country is quite, uh, quite upfront in, in looking at waste management. We've secured a contract for a space with the uh, from, from the local government. And I think we're calling in lots of partners, like telecommunication companies who can give these uh, airtime awards, and as well as funders uh, to support our project. So we're currently uh, developing a pilot uh, and test, testing the MVP to see how it will roll out in the market. Well, there you have it, cleaning up Dar es Salaam, making sure that Tanzania becomes one of the cleanest uh, uh, countries on the African continent. They're leveraging off technology, and they're putting in incentives for families and households to participate, whether it's airtime or food or any other other incentives, certainly a model that we're going to be keeping our eyes on. Let's move to South Africa now and find out what this young lady is up to. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much once again. So tell us about your project. Thank you. My name is Lomile Mukoka. My company is eSubmit. Now this is an online building plan application um, a platform. So basically, as an architect, I've gone through the process of, of submitting building plans many times. So I understand how grueling and tedious and costly this process is, and that's how the idea came about. So this platform allows uh, the public to submit building plans online, and these plans can be examined by the municipality online also. So it's much greener for the environment, and it does allow for a speedy process. So it's paperless, it's greener, but what about accessibility? Because we do know that there are swathes of parts of the population that are not actually uh, au fait with technology. How do you bridge that gap so that you make it even easier for them to participate? This is very simple. Many people, I'm aware that many people do draw by hand. So instead of going and photocopying pages and pages in order to submit to the municipality, they just scan one copy, upload it at an internet cafe, pay the relevant fee, and from there they'll be able to track the progress of their submission. And the municipality also will, will also be able to screen those applications and flag them time uh, to say uh, this application is incorrect or incomplete uh, before they proceed to examine the plans, which often takes uh, anything from 30 days to months. So certainly efficiency is a, a block that you've certainly ticked. What about cost? Is it, is it cheaper to go the online application route as against the multiple trips to the municipality that the average person would have to go? Oh, it definitely is a lot cheaper. I mean, first of all, the printing costs are enormous because as you know, architects or, or, or draftspeople, they print, print big building plans. So also for property developers, they often lose hundreds of thousands of rands caused just by those delays in getting approvals. So if the delays, if those delays can be alleviated and the plans are submitted online and it can be efficient, then they'll have a lot more money in their pockets. <laughs> well, we've been talking about municipalities becoming more efficient. This seems to be a knocking on the problem on both sides, both from those who are submitting plans as well as municipalities who then have to deal with those application processes. Efficiency, certainly a box that's been ticked and also seems that it's also uh, cost efficient. Another one that we're going to be keeping our eyes on and obviously watching to see whether how she does uh, in uh, this afternoon's round. Finally, we're going off to Nigeria where we're catching up with Isaac. Isaac, uh, give us a sense of how's it going and in particular, what's your project and your business all about? 
Hi, I'm Isaac from Nigeria and I represent um, Clear Waterbot. Clear Waterbot is a device that um, helps farmers to ramp up production by using less resources. Right, so fish farmers are working in tandem with small scale farmers to end world hunger, provide our protein and all that. Yeah, this is a lofty idea, but in doing this, they, especially in Nigeria from where I come from, they pollute the environment and use tons and tons of water. So Clear Waterbot aims to end this. We hope to reduce um, the amount of water used, say up to 90% every month, and also ramp up production by up to 50% per harvest. This is aside from the other gains from time saved and also the benefits for the environment. Certainly very big ambitions and this is uh, certainly a, a, a program or a project that's looking at shifting the dial uh, significantly in the Nigerian context. What do you need to make this happen? Is it a question of funding? Is it a question of partnerships? What is it that's going to get this program off the ground and successful? Okay, so to take off, we will need funding, lots and lots of funding. We also need partnership from, say, NGOs that are into water conservation and environmental protection, for example, and also governments, social responsibility, providing jobs, empowerment, women, youth, um, stuff like that. And what's been the experience uh, on the ground so far? Well, certainly you must have run some pre-pilots uh, just to test the appetite for this idea. Have you gotten the reception that you were hoping for? Okay, so at, at present, um, it's still at, at an idea stage. Mm -hmm. We've been talking to um, local fish farmers, and they think it's a lofty idea. Um, Eventually, when we get to the stage where we do a prototype and then do some beta testing, so we'll get them aboard and share the results with them. They will probably be very happy to, you know, to come aboard. Well, they say that it usually starts with lofty ideas, and then those lofty ideas be translated into business plans. And before you know it, you're changing the landscape, not only of your community, but of the continent as a whole. These are the young entrepreneurs and the young innovators that were joining, that were joining us here in Johannesburg today. It's certainly been an exciting part of the mornings chatting to them, and we'll be following their progress as the day progresses and as they fight it out for 2,000 US dollars. Thank you so much guys for making the time to join us remember if you want me and the young money crew to come to you all you need to do is just follow me on twitter at the real nosy and of course uh, at cnbc africa don't forget the hashtag it's young money 410 until next time it's goodbye <laughs>